There are a lot of problems with the way we've organized our occupation of the landscape. Some of them are logistical, social, even spiritual problems, and some of them are ecological and economic problems. Any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources and based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources, so-called, any way of life that perceives the world around them as consisting of resources and not beings and communities to enter into these reciprocal relationships with is going to destroy its land base. This culture has been destroying its land base for the last 6,000 years. That's not very smart on a finite planet. We're really fucked. It's basically, these trees are like the structure, they're like the, 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 the scaffolding that holds up the whole house of a healthy ecosystem. I can say it in words, you can watch it on TV, if you walk through a tree plantation, where almost all the trees are of the same age, almost all the trees are of the same species, they were planted there by humans, they were developed genetically to be what human beings wanted to have and you see what grows there, you see what lives there, you see what it feels like. You walk out of that and you walk into an old growth forest that is exactly what used to be where that tree plantation was. It's like a line that runs sometimes, a line where they drew and they said, cut here, not there yet. You walk across that line and you're back on earth. Machines come back after a certain number of years, cut it all down, do it again, and pretend like they can do that over and over. Just like the early farmers in America pretended that they could grow crops without fertilizing until the Dust Bowl came. So we deplete the soil, we grow the tree farm, and all the species are gone. Sometimes they're gone in that they just shifted to another place in the forest, but sometimes they're gone forever. And that's extinction. And extinction is not death, it's the end of birth. It doesn't come back ever. When I started writing Ishmael, I knew that we were attacking the biological diversity of the planet, but I had no idea that we had already entered into a period of mass extinctions. It's estimated that as many as 200 species a day are becoming extinct. This is roughly a thousand times the normal rate of extinction. There, of course, have been extinctions throughout the history of life on the planet, but this is what is meant by a mass extinction, like happened in the late Permian period when the dinosaurs disappeared. The historical assumptions we have about the quote great buildings of the world the Egyptian pyramids, the European and Asian fortresses, the great and marvelous metropolises that we see around us. They're expressions of a civilization and they're great records, okay, but what are they records of? In fact, in most cases, um, they were created by the oppression of others. And in, in, in some cases, the downright slavery of, of generations and generations of people. And so you think, well, what's so important and valuable about that. What does that mean to us now? You know, we're still doing that today. I think Buckminster Fuller summed it up pretty well with the idea of uh, energy slaves, where we have, um, you know, energy has been, become so cheap um, and it does a lot of work for us. Um, and if you were to convert the kind of 
the relationship between the amount of energy that each of us use in the city and, and this kind of way of living, um, if you were to compare that energy to the amount of human energy it would have taken in the form of slaves working for us, um, each one of us would have at our disposal something like 400 slaves. Now this was 1960 some odd when Fuller first calculated this. I would guess it's probably double or triple that by now. Like uh, my guess is I'd probably got you know a thousand energy slaves working for me, doing all this kind of work for me. Um, that's absolutely not sustainable. There's a lot of different reasons that our normal lives are things that we need to look at and change. For example, our normal life is ecologically unsustainable. I mean, we are destroying the life support systems of the planet. Our normal life also creates huge disparities in health and wealth, which these are both really important issues. They're not anything that are, that's going to cause us to change society or change the structure of the system. Now, this whole normal life being underwritten by cheap and abundant fossil fuels, this concept right here, that could lead to change. Oil being a finite substance will come to some point where it actually hits a maximum level, then it goes into a declining. At that point where it starts to go into decline, we're going to have to figure out how to make do with less. We don't know how to do that. A lot of people have very high hopes, uh, you might even call them wishes, that technology is going to come to the rescue and solve these energy problems we have and actually allow us to continue running our stuff the way we're running it. No combination of alternative energy systems is going to allow us to run North America the way we've been used to running it or even a substantial fraction of it. We're going to have to downscale and rescale and resize and right size and reorganize all of these systems. When do we run out? And of course the answer to that is very disturbing because it's, it's not really a matter of when we run out but when we are no longer able to continue the path of growth. When we're no longer able to have more fossil fuels with every passing year to fuel more shopping malls, more cars, more highways. And that time is basically now. America's housing infrastructure is extremely vulnerable to the problem of peak oil. We've built millions of houses that have to be heated with fossil fuels. So how are we going to heat all of these houses? Most of us are living in places that get really cold in the winter. I mean, you really can freeze to death in places like Iowa and Minnesota and upper New York State. So we're going to have to figure out an alternative to the standard American house and do it really quickly. We need to reinvent our normal lives so that they are not only ecologically sustainable and not only socially just, but we need to make them much, much less dependent on fossil fuels. I show pictures of people quite a bit because I 
find there are still lingering stereotypes of what the third world is about, and part of my job is to dispel those stereotypes. So I ask people, do these folks look like they're starving? No. Do they look unhappy? Do they look repressed? Are they badly dressed? Are they the vision of the third world that is projected to us by the media? I didn't see anybody hungry. I didn't see anybody emaciated or looking like the pictures you see of folks starving. I didn't see anybody violent. In all my time there, I never saw a poisonous snake or an elephant or a bare breast or any of those stereotypes one has of Africans. Very hospitable, civilized, lovely people I was talking I suppose there were jerks everywhere, but I didn't meet them. And I spent quite a lot of time in West Africa. All over the world, people are just people. And until we drag them into the cash economy and force them to go to work to do things they don't want to do, and be in factories to make cheap clothes for us or whatever it is, they're very happy in Germany. It's a subjective observation, but I've spent a lot of time with a lot of people. I think that's the generalization of the world. We tend to think it's them and us, but then we get looking at who us is, and I realize that our own ancestors not very long ago were actually behaving the same sorts of ways. time in Africa, there is a, of times of necessity, a connection with the natural scheme of things. The sun, the wind, the water, the earth, a very direct relationship where you actually having all five senses constantly engaged by those major natural elements. The beauty, the most fundamental beauty of earthbound and earth center building is the fact that it's easy, it's capable of being modified. So as we keep growing and keep asking questions and keep hopefully becoming slightly wiser about something beyond our grasp, we decide to shift our physical resources, including our buildings, in a certain way. We want to do something to them to reflect this new awareness. The earth, earth and building allows one to do that relatively easy and in a way that doesn't compromise the open-ended integrity really of, of what that design is. It's sensuous to the hand, all that. It's gravy. I think the cake is you know even as you're doing it that when it hardens and dries and it's polished and impregnated with the proper finishing coats that it isn't finished and you aren't upset. You know it's capable of being further enriched and it's just a good feeling. have something called Dawadawa tree. That Dawadawa leaf, we soak it in water. And you see this gravel. After pounding this, uh, we use the water, watering it. Uh, you will see that it becomes brown and strong like cement. So uh, locally, if we don't get cement, that's what we do. And uh, so cement is a new uh, technology. But uh, this formerly uh, what we used to do. Up till now, some of us are still used in it. And it's very good. It's very hard, like cement. Do you have 
to change the roof every few years. When the grass are rotten, mm -hmm. and it takes so many years before it rotten, mm -hmm. some take more than 15 years, wow. 20 years before you can change it. And after now, it's more than 30 years now. This is done. It's more than 30 years. You see, no cement here. my home. This village is over a thousand years old. Here within our beliefs, we feel that this is the beginning of time. And right here I am in front of my family's home. And everything here is actually all built out of a adobe, water, and straw. What we do is you pour the mixture into a long rectangular mold with about ten different sections. Each section is about six inches deep. And let the mixture set for a few days or so. And once it is dry, we have what we call adobes, which are the bricks that the homes are made out of. And what we do is we put a foundation of adobe brick on the bottom layer and we plaster with a certain amount of mud on top and make it a nice flat surface for the floor of the home. And then we just build on the inside, from the inside out. Generally, the walls themselves will only be one adobe brick thick. And just depending on how each family maintains their home, each home contains over a hundred layers of adobe plaster itself because we do repair our homes very regularly. So in general here, we try to keep the lifestyle very simplistic. We live completely for the land and maintaining its beauty and the sacredness to us. A majority of our maintenance process here and the building itself is pretty much well known throughout the tribe. Generally, we try to encourage our youth before they reach the age of 16 that they do know how to make adobe brick because that within itself is a very important legacy of our people here maintaining the culture at the same time and the beauty of home. So generally, adobe brick and the process of making the home and the process of plastering is pretty much known by all youth by the time they are reaching the age 16. Permaculture is the way that we become indigenous to a place, the way that we really attune ourselves to what grows there, what lives there, how all the systems of nature work there. And part of that has to become how we inhabit that place, you know, what shelters we build for ourselves, how we actually live on that land. And that's what I love about natural building. All of our ancestors knew how to do this, and all of them built with mud and with indigenous materials, and all of them knew how to create beautiful things, or at least somewhere in everyone's ancestry, somebody knew. <laughs> and to just call those ancestors in and ask them to help guide our hands. Fantasy with building an architecture started at a very young age for me, you know, building stump boards, tree houses. I was forever in my youth involved with scrounging materials and building the tree houses pretty much were my main theme in my youth. In high school I really got into an architectural program and spent a great deal of my high school time 
drawing, very wild and creative, curvy buildings. But I found a really creative builder that really I was really impressed with his work. I was looking at him and I showed him some drawings that I've been doing. And he said, you know, you better go buy a hammer because nobody's going to build this stuff for you. So I took his advice, I bought a hammer, quit college, and I started to build. I built my first house. Like I said, once I found college, well, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Low cost, inexpensive, sculptable material that you can build with. And you can cobbles, everything. Now, and the beauty and the shape and the forms that we can do with cop, you can't do with any other media. It was a great process of determining what I would be doing in the space, what my needs were, what the needs were if other people were here. So I designed the house with things in mind, like I have a window that's on the south side that has shelving in it for sprouting wheatgrass. And there's a little warm nook that's a good spot for sourdough cultures and yogurt cultures. It's those kind of qualities that really excite me about living in a cob house. It's like a little ship. It's like a little dance that you do in the space. And the more in tune you are with it, the more efficient it gets. Actually, this house was a was really a fun experiment in in planning in all the little uh, exciting things that I could, uh, like the compost chute going through the wall, um, the PVC pipe goes through, and then uh, it connects to a hood that affixes to the tube and then to a bucket, so it's a closed system. Uh, the the little altar nook over there. It has a mirror in the back of the niche, and it, the mirror is actually angled forward so that then when you have a light, um, a lamp in that nook, it casts the light down onto the table that's sitting in front. So those little things are really exciting. All these things are ancient materials, they're somewhat ancient techniques, but the buildings that are resulting now are thoroughly modern. They're modern structures because we're using ancient materials but we're applying them in a modern context, in a modern design. And so we're coming up with buildings that are way, way more efficient it's not about going back into the dark ages. It's about taking these materials and moving very much into the future. What I think this whole natural building movement is about is building small, building economically, so that then you have the time, you don't have a 30-year mortgage that way. Yes, it took time to build it, but ultimately not having that debt is going to give you more free time to do what you want and I would much rather be at home puttering around fixing my stair or like the little board that springs loose than uh, in some you know, veal fattening pen at a computer uh, for somebody, working for somebody else. Uh, um, why? why? What's the point? Um, it's a really great trade-off. I love that. I love that idea. Earth is the building material of choice for one third of the planet. It's alive, it purifies toxins, it is of the place, it has incredibly low embodied energy. It's probably the best building material from the sustainability perspective. It passes the acid test if you do life cycle analysis on earth materials. If you just look 
at all of the energy, water, and materials impacts of the entire life cycle, Earth wins, hands down. The biggest advantage of earth building is that earth is such a ubiquitous material. Most places that people are building, there's earth. And that's huge. That's a huge, huge factor. I think it's hard for people who are raised in an industrial society where energy is very, very cheap to understand the significance of that fact because we're used to thinking nothing of moving huge amounts of material including very heavy material very long distances but traditionally throughout the history of humanity that has not been an option and it's very possible that that will come to be less of an option in the near to middle future even in wealthy places like the United States. So just learning to build with the stuff that is there on the site is an incredibly valuable thing. One of the other big advantages that Earth has as a building material is its weight. Because Earth is a massive, heavy material, it has the ability to store heat, or conversely, to store coolness over a long period of time. A heavy earthen wall takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. And it turns out that that's critical for efficient passive solar construction. If you want to build a house that is going to be heated mainly with the sun, you need a way to store the heat that's coming in from the sun during the daytime and keep it in the building to release during the nighttime, which is when you really need it. In the daytime, the sun's out, temperatures are high, everything's good. But at night, temperatures are gonna drop. You're a lot more likely to be inside your house at night. And that's really when you need that heat. So the thermal mass of Earth, either in your walls or in your floor, can hold and store that heat until you need it. There's a technical aspect to building with Earth that makes it very accessible to lots of people. Most of the Earth and building techniques are so simple that people can learn how to do them in a matter of hours to days. We have lots of experience from Cobb Cottage Company in workshop teaching of people who took, say, a week-long workshop with very little to no previous building experience and went from that directly into building their own homes. Usually people require some help with the more technical aspects, but the actual earth building technique is so simple that most people can pick it up very quickly. It's very, very easy for people without much training and without much technical background to achieve really spectacular results. In fact, it's, uh, it's practically inevitable. <laughs> I've almost never seen anybody build anything out of cob that wasn't beautiful. So that's pretty remarkable in and of itself. Still haven't seen it really turn into a mainstream technique that's being used for mass housing developments. And maybe it never will. But in the meantime, I think the biggest impact that Cobb is having is allowing people who want to be building for themselves and who don't have a lot of resources or a lot of training to learn a technique quite quickly that enables them to build a really beautiful and really special home for themselves. I really do see two worlds. Architects are simply unaware of Earth in all of its forms and variations. They're not specifying it. They're not encouraging their clients to build with it. And then there's this whole world of renegade, Builders, uh, or people that 
are really fundamentally activists, are working from the heart and want to change the world and are deciding, I've got to learn enough about building so I can do an earth building. I don't need to be a <clears throat> builder my whole life, but I need to do this building. One young woman came in here yesterday and she really got it. First of all, she suddenly felt that she didn't have real life skills and that learning how to build like this would be a really valuable skill and fairly easily obtained. And that, re that reminded me of how I felt. Even though I was an architect, I didn't really know how to build a house. In theory I did, but I had no idea. And when I came out of that co-op workshop, that my world had changed because I felt like I had the power and the know-how. And it isn't, it's not know-how, it's know-how <laughs> in the hands to do it. And that changes your world. It was wearing out my body, especially my right arm and especially my elbow and my wrist from hammering and sawing and all the noise and toxic wood and stuff and it was just like I was getting fed up with that part. So then when I saw that you could build without having that right armness and that poison and noise you know, really excludes other people. You don't go up to somebody who's sawing a board and say, hi, what you doing? But this whole idea of the cob was so inclusive of people and so much easier on my body and on my nose and, you know, my lungs and everything. And then, of course, the wonderful people that it attracts just expanded my life and my experience of learning how to get along and gathering and working together. And so it, it ended up being this much bigger thing than, than I pictured in the first place, which was just like, oh, this is so beautiful, this is so cool, you know, I, I want everybody to do it. And then slowly it just became that I don't even care that much about the, the cob itself. It's the process of the people getting together and sharing and realizing that they can do what they dream, or that they can be freer of the expectations that have been put on them. And Cobb kind of tells people that in a real cellular way. And you can watch how it affects the people. You know, at first they're kind of skeptical and asking technical questions and you know, frowning, and then by about day three they're just laughing and they're covered in dirt and they're having conversations, deep conversations about what they maybe could do in their life. But it seems to be a, a standard sort of evolution process that humans go through when they're cobbing and working together and giving up that, okay, we have to look good and clean and, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing and you're doing what you're doing, where you just eat together and you work together and create together and make decisions together. It's just selfish. It, I don't do it because I want to save the world. You know, I do it because I want to save myself. Well, about 14 years ago, I didn't have a roof over my head. I got divorced and I had about $4,000. One of the things 
that was most important was to get that roof over our head. I was advised by friends and family to get a little mobile home and park it either here on my parents' property where I'm at or somewhere else. And I just didn't want to. I, I felt that I had learned a way of building a house. I had taken the first Cobb Cottage workshop and had learned how to build Cobb and I felt that if my parents said I could park a mobile home on their property, why not build my own little house? So I did. And I started building it pretty much by myself, but my parents helped with some of the woodwork. And um, four months later I moved in and have been living happily ever after. So it was a, a very quick process and, and, uh, and it was never regretted. It was wonderful. I think of the, the mobile house once in a while, thinking of what it would have been like to, to live in a, one of those boxes and there's just no comparison. I've never since then doubted who I am because when you follow that first crazy dream, which Cobb was for me, why should you have doubts about anything else that you have inside you, other dreams you have? So I've tended to think that Cobb has strengthened who I am and that strength it's shown to everybody who comes and, and visits, um, you know, whether it's for a few minutes or for days or old friends or new friends. I think they feel the strength of the house because that's what was put into it, was, was my own strength. And it's a testament every day to me that I did it, I can do it, and I can do just about anything. If, if it's a good goal, go for it. So, yay Cobb. <laughs> she was, how old were you then? Nine. I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, forgot your name. <laughs> <laughs> forgot my age. Right. <laughs> so maybe you'd like to talk about okay, that. Okay. About that. <laughs>
the parks board approached me to to build that building and of course I, I just I, I jumped on the opportunity I mean Stanley Park is the is the premier park in North America it's one of the most um, beautiful parks in in the world and thousands of visitors go to Stanley Park yearly so it would be an amazing opportunity to showcase Cobb building uh, it was very very exciting I think we're at a turning point in the city where the city is seriously looking at sustainability and really interested in showcasing sustainability projects. So, so it's great timing now to get involved in car. Having the city get behind it and, and support it to the degree that they have legitimizes Cobb in a way that we haven't seen before at that level. As well, the, the university was very interested in doing some seismic testing and, and um, they made available their labs, the seismic shape table and everything for us at no cost. So um, Steve Lay, uh, who was my partner in the project, he, he coordinated the seismic testing so he built a scale model and we were able to, to test it. The main thing for the earthquake design, uh, we managed to conscript uh, Professor Carlos Ventura at the university who was engaged in building a rather large uh, shape table for testing uh, buildings and elements of buildings and earthquakes and prevailed upon him to test our uh, COP building. So a half scale model was built using exactly the same techniques as will be used in the full scale model and the building was put on the shape table and tested to destruction. And I will say it defied all expectations and survived the testing very well until they put on an earthquake that was about three times the maximum credible earthquake that could possibly occur in Western Canada and managed to crack the thing up. Even at that stage it didn't actually collapse uh, but parts of the walls fell out. But uh, it would still have met the criteria of the building code that that building did not collapse and people, any occupants, could uh, evacuate the building without injury. An old guy called Alfie Howard, who is quite well known in the cob building world in these parts. He was probably the first person in this part of the world to begin the cob revival. Nineteen thirty-six, they got a church wall, and over the years, the weather had, the weather had, had uh, put paint down. He come down, and they insisted that he had to be put back as he was before, because he was listed. My father got a building business then, and they got hold of my father to do it. And he got my oldest brother, me, up for doing it. And he taught us how to do it. Because he'd learned it from his father, that would be my grandpa. And, and that's how it's come to starting club. That was in 1936. Well, it's the simplest thing of all. You'd be surprised what you put up in a day. It really is. Well, see, that's all the eight years ago, wasn't it? But treading cob, when it's got any big job on, I usually have a little mega pen and put two little bullocks in there and get somebody to keep them walking, see, and they tread the cob.
very different and quite a sobering experience coming back here and working on that project because a very different for, for, for a start the method is different you use a pitchfork so you really yeah, don't okay. you really don't get your hands in it and it's a very different kind of I would say in the States it's in the way that we were taught it's that very sort of tactile touchy feely you know you put like all sensual. your heart and your soul into it whereas we came here and it felt like we were on a sort of a conventional building site really but just the material was different so the approach was still quite conventional mm. and conservative it was just a different material but I come from this history of tradition instead of from a new wave of a new movement let's use this as an eco material <laughs> So we're literally, with a pitchfork, taking big scoops from the pile and placing it onto the wall and positioning it, scooping it, positioning it. So we're not actually using our hands, we're actually using a utensil, a tool, to actually pick it up and do that. We find that it's much quicker, but you don't have the same interaction that you normally would, you know, with actually picking it up with your hands and mixing it by your feet. You know, it's, it's a different connection that you have with the material. Yeah, I mean, I use a JCB now. I've only recently got, I've been building in cold blood, I don't know, 15 years or so, and I only got the JCB two years ago. Uh, mind you, I'd never look back. It's a perfect tool if you've got the site where you've got accessibility for that kind of size of machine, you know. It just takes all the laborious mixing out of it, and you can still be very creative with it, but, you know, just get a heck of a lot more done. Well, this whole structure has been designed by an engineer, or at least, you know, I might have designed it, but he's checked it all, he's designed all the beam sizes, he's designed the roof structure itself. I mean, basically, Cobb is incredibly strong, compressively. In terms of, say, a concrete block, it's about a third as strong as a standard concrete block. It's at least one newton per square millimetre in terms of compressive strength. Considering you generally tend to build quite wide walls anyway in a building which needs to be well insulated, so you can spread the load, any point loads, over a bigger area. It's really not an issue whether it's structurally up to it. I mean, it's easily structurally up to it. The sites are very expensive in this part of the world. So you kind of have to make the most of a site to make it economically viable. I mean, this house here, you know, you're a million pound house. They're very valuable properties in this part of the world, really. We're not looking at cheap house in here, it's, it's high quality end of the market. I come at it because I think it's just a great material to use, you know, and a more satisfying way to build, and something I can feel happy with to leave behind, you know. But I also think it's quite important to be part of the mainstream and bring it in, because it's taken more seriously by everybody then. working away doing very simple building techniques and you know, somehow I got this award from the Queen and she invited us to come to Buckingham Palace and so we spent the evening at Buckingham Palace. She just said that she was very interested in what we're doing and reviving traditional skills and traditional crafts. And people who are dealing with hierarchy and people who are in governmental system and building system you know, they do sort of perk up a bit if they know that, that we're dealing yeah. with those sort of people. You know, they'll, they'll take it a bit more seriously, especially when it comes to building codes and things like that.
earth buildings in Yemen, I wouldn't call them earth buildings. I would be more specific because there are various types of buildings that use materials which are from the very soil or the earth or the ground or mountains or wadis. Regarding mud brick architecture, which has been my speciality or point of interest for the last at least 25, if not more years, I've worked in some great detail at establishing how these buildings are made. dates to buildings. The buildings I've worked on definitely go back to 200, 300 and some more years, but we know for a fact that these buildings have been there since pre-Islamic times, so we're talking of civilizations as old as Seba, uh, Queen of Sheba. And I think if you go back to Genesis, you'll find the mention of both Shibam and Tarim and Hadramut in the Torah. Now how they're made is extremely complex because Yemen is one of the most sophisticated civilizations that has maintained and continued to construct its buildings and its, its architecture with these materials. When you've got seven and eight and nine floors constructed in sun-dried mud brick, it's already a huge feat both engineeringly and construction-wise and when it comes to design it's superior. You know, whether you construct palaces in sun-dried mud brick and can build up to 40 rooms and 40 bathrooms in one building, as in Khayla, for example, one just has to look and see, you know, why and what has made this so incredible and amazing. Do you know something, apart from trying to be philosophical or sounding scientific about the ecology of these buildings, essentially the fact that this architecture has worked so well for hundreds of years for its inhabitants and it's an architecture that can identify as a culture, as a deep, profound culture, which is very closely related to the socio-economics of communities that have lived there and that have mastered and been the masters of this civilization for so long, I think in itself ought to acknowledge the importance of it ecologically and otherwise. I think the best way to compare it ecologically or to discuss it or identify it as ecologically viable or sound or sustainable is just compare it with the ugly, mediocre, uh, imported Western forms of buildings that are being used there, which are commercially viable because they fit into a more um, speculation market kind of economy. Culturally devoid, completely. It's not just that they are great because they are ecologically important. It's not that they are great because they are cheaper to build and because people know how to construct them. But it's because there's a very strong cultural, economic, social discipline related to the entire matrix that is built around them, you know, which makes these places very important and it makes these places exceptional and it makes these places 
comparable to any other beautiful city that you find in Florence or in Italy in the countryside. So if you look back at, at the history of, of humanity, or if you look at what's left of indigenous people, uh, you quickly come to understand that human beings uh, evolved to live in small, what we call human scale, for a good reason, um, small groups of people, face-to-face -face communication, the experience of being in close community. If the kind of hunger for materials that speak of place and, and the human hand and so on are powering natural building right now, there is absolute starvation in the culture as it exists now for community interaction. And so it's a, it's a tremendous need waiting to be met. You know, we have all kinds of synthetic substitutes for community now with these things where people try and get together to do things but the ability to walk out your door and get your required daily dose of human interaction with people who aren't part of your nuclear family is absolutely going unmet and so that's why the work that's happening up in Portland with the village building convergence and city repair and so on excites people so much because it is the ends toward which natural building was ultimately meant to be. None of the people who have ever lived on this street or who will ever live on this street have ever had a say in how their lives would be organized. None of them have ever said, for instance, hey, let's move the functions of living away from the functions of working. Let's disintegrate those things. So that when we come home at the end of the day after working with people we don't tend to get to know, let's live among people that we don't tend to get to know. No one ever said, hey, let's make everything bilaterally symmetrical as far as the eye can see, north, south, east, and west, and let's do it to every city west of the Ohio River all the way to the Pacific Ocean. San Diego, Seattle, Portland, St. Louis, Chicago. What effectively happened was the great commons of this land was converted into a commodity. Locating the great commons there in the intersection is just simply to recognize that where our pathways come together, so do our lives. This is the most profound principle of urban design, the intersection. The idea that you enable people to intersect however you can to enable them to communicate, to meet each other, to facilitate events, things that happen. It's about facilitating communication, not just the movement of goods and services. It's about helping people to build relationship. Everything goes on in the piazza, and I suppose you could say conversely that if you don't have a piazza, if your neighborhood doesn't feature even one public square, how much is going to be going on? That principle of build it and they will come, or build it and something will happen, what if it's not there? What if you think you have freedom of assembly and nowhere to assemble? In fact, in the United States, we have fewer outdoor gathering places and indoor gathering places than probably any other country in the history of the world. And also the most acute social isolation and its associated problems of any first world country. I'm going to take you into Portland, Oregon now to show you our great experiment with that city. We looked at the city as a whole, we compared it to village-based cultures that have many more gathering places and ways to connect. We noticed by these comparisons that Portland alone was missing between 1,500 and 5,000 outdoor public gathering places. So we thought, okay, let's put one of them back and just see what would happen. In advance of this day when we came out to paint the street without permission, we were building these little structures in an adjacent yard about a block away, a place for neighborhood news, 
a 24-hour tea station, a family-sized bench, a kid's clubhouse, a place for art and poetry, all these trading installations, a stage, and a little library. And of course, what we were doing was we were seeding a garden of the village. We were regrowing the village heart with all of the functions and amenities that you'll find. Go to Europe, go to Africa, you'll find all this vitality at the village heart. So we were saying, we can have that too, we ought to have it. What we were doing was calling attention to the fact that we didn't have even one public square in the entire city, not one public living room. But we built one in Portland, and it had this incredible catalytic effect. It was so inspirational to a city that it had never even known what this could be like. It said that there is a place where we all belong, where time and space is not for sale. It was so successful in building community, it's just the barn raising. It's not even a new idea. It's an old, old idea that is our absolute birthright. Get together, do something that uplifts the common life, build relationships that way, dance, eat together, wake up the next day with new ideas, not so afraid of each other or the world. So very logically here in the Sunnyside neighborhood, you see the neighborhood taking their emblem, the sunflower, their logo, and laying it down on the street. So it's a very exciting thing. You just build an example, people experience it spatially, and then they can start to talk about it, and then other people want to do it. That location doesn't even need a stop sign. People just come to a stop or they slow way down. The way we understand the effect is that they can see from a distance that it's different from everything else. So place is used to calm traffic instead of barriers. And it just calls out that people might be present. Those are small projects, and so are these. And each one of them is really a node. It's a way that people co connect, intersect with each other. It's something that draws them, attracts them, gives them something to talk about. Here again, another household giving up part of their front yard to create a little gathering place for the community. So people actually perceiving that they can go over the lines and invite other people, even strangers, to come onto their space to just linger for a while, overcoming their fears. This is called the Memorial Life House, where a young man named Matt Sheckle was crushed by a large truck that went through this stop sign. His bike was locked to the base of the stop sign, and people kept bringing flowers and mementos. And he was very popular in the alternative transportation culture. His mother would come and sit on the corner and cry. And finally, one of the neighbors, the woman who lives on this corner, who had held Matt when he was dying in his last few moments, she came out and invited people to just take a piece of her property and make a memorial to Matt's life. Poetry Plaza, a place where this woman in the green dress gives up her front yard for local students to come and write poems, for people to leave original poems in that little mailbox there, for people to just come and take and to leave. So this is where people are saying, I can give up this space that I have and enable other people to access it. This is one of the biggest things that we've ever done. This is a building that's entire, made out of all recycled and natural materials. Even the steel is recycled. It's a facility that takes stuff that's going to the dump, filters it, and sells it back to the public. Old two-by-fours, toilets, stuff like that. Tons and tons of stuff goes out of the waste stream, including what the building itself is made out of. It's just profoundly important to embed our new understandings and visions and awarenesses as a society in the physical landscape around us so that we can see that our understandings are shared and that the world is changing. This community is a historical neighborhood. It's been here since the 1800s. Many of the people in this community were part of the neighborhood that would feed its community, part of the Black Panthers. I mean, just a whole community of people. This was once a, a thriving blues community. So if you can imagine people, it was barbecue in this community. Uh, 
you know, fish. You can come down here and get, I mean, just any type of home, down home food that you want to get. And now those stores are, you know, slowly dwindling. But Oakland during the 50s and 60s was a mecca for black people simply because of the jobs. People moved here in the 40s from the South because of the war effort and the factories that existed in the Bay Area for people to move to. And those factories ended up producing other things afterward. They quickly were shut down. It left a large section of the working class, mainly black people in the Bay Area having to find other forms of income. There hasn't been any big production jobs for black people in Oakland for a good 40 years when plants started closing down and being moved to Mexico for cheaper labor. You know, it used to be that since they did have some industry in Oakland, they needed black people to be close to the factories and things like that. We don't got that anymore, so we don't need black people in the cities anymore. We know that one way that gentrification works is by saying to people that may be consciously or unconsciously racist that you won't have to deal with these black people that are here. They're either going to be gone or the police have them locked away and scared enough to not come out. When you look at what city repair is done with corners, this is very interesting because these corners are well utilized all the time. And there's a sense that the corner is a place for show time, so to say. It's a place for fashion. It's a place for conversation. But it's never really a comfortable place because you can have enforcement coming at any time. People will call the police on, on on people if they see a bunch of young black people hanging out on the corner and just call the police. Police will come and harass people and this and that and even if nobody gets arrested for having things after a while people are like I'm not hanging out there. That in Oakland they had 350 cops just three and a half years ago now they got a thousand cops patrolling black people San Francisco's double is police force and every area major, major metropolis where black people live all across this country they've double, triple and quadruple their police force equipped them with tanks all kind of, uh uh we got to stop it brother let's get together and unify it. The first thing I thought was, seriously, it's like a new revolution. I thought of communities becoming involved in something that they hadn't ordinarily become involved in before. It seemed like a movement that this community had seen before, but in a different sense. It meant that there was more connectivity between each other. There was more communication. And the idea is that some people will move in and integrate into black neighborhoods that really want to be part of the community. But the way to fight this taking over of a neighborhood is to make art and make things where the neighborhood can congregate more. And that if you're going to come, you're going to end up having to be part of the community. So if we create art and create things that make more community, rather than just beautify the property, of beautify the ways that we can interact with each other, then that will in turn beautify the landscape and the property too.
traditional building styles of Thailand was lightweight housing using bamboo, using other grasses, thatch for roofing, bamboo for structure. People didn't really use a cash-based economy. It was barter-based and they had what they needed. It's about 30 years ago that the cement industry started spreading itself throughout the world. People were drawn to cement housing, concrete, because it's more permanent and takes less maintenance and care than something like bamboo. People, farmers and villagers who had always had within their villages the resources to take care of themselves and their families were beginning to depend on the dollar. The reality of housing oneself and housing one's family meant that people were going into lifetimes of debt. Earthen building came in as a replacement for that. I was in Thailand and was on a little fishing boat and the man behind me I thought was pretty interesting. So we struck up a conversation and within 10 minutes he shared with me, he was the director of one of Southeast Asia's um, kind of most established activist training centers in near Bangkok. And I shared what I was doing and he invited me to come teach in Thailand. We didn't know what the results would be or who would be interested. We did a 10 day workshop and hundreds of people got turned on. We started helping villagers get out of debt and learning again how to be self-reliant when they have the option to build with earth and create long-standing homes that would serve them well. So earth and housing now in Thailand is really an alternative to the environmentally and financially costly cement housing. We were looking for who here could help carry this work forward so that we can remove ourselves from this process or become more of just support for work that continues on, that Thai people themselves take it and run with it. We worked with networks that were teaching farmers how to get out of debt, become self-reliant, and they have now built natural building into their self-reliance curriculum. I think there are up to about 18 centers throughout different regions of Thailand. At each center they teach something like 600 people per month. So 600 times 18 per month times 12 months. So they're teaching tens of thousands of people a year in Thailand. Um, and part of that curriculum is natural building. Yeah, and the story in Thailand is fantastic. It's really an incredible success story of natural building and a larger natural building movement and the way it can help transform on a deep social level. It's wonderful to be involved with this work and do a program or a project and watch the exponential potential of what can happen. The challenge we find is that what you need is a really deep connection with your local community. And coming from outside, that takes time. If you're going in as a bunch of people who are wanting to help or do good or something, um, it just becomes just a continuation of that same paradigm. But once you realize that if you're traveling to a place, you are getting as much if not more out of that experience than the people that you are working with, then it becomes more of a two-way street and there's a sense of partnership for a mutual goal. And that becomes a different thing and I think it increases the possibility of success because there's less of an imposition of an idea that's coming from outside but more of a, hey, let's figure this out together. 
One thing to me that's beautiful about natural building um, is that you don't have to speak the same language as the people you're working with because the language is more about the body and the mud and the materials. Um, when I first worked in Thailand, I was working with people who, many of whom we didn't speak the same language and uh, it was so much fun and they're so into it, so energetic and uh, I had never before worked with people who so smoothly just flowed together. Not much organization had to happen, not much talking and planning, it just happened and I think working with people who are connected to a village-based culture where there's a sense of cooperation and doing things together regularly that that just filtered through everything we did there. I learned so much more about the spirit of cooperation and having a really good time on a site. There is one measure by which we, we will be judged by the people who come after, and that's the health of the land base. That's the only thing that matters. The only thing. They're not going to care for nice people. They will care that they have water to drink, and that they have food to eat, and that they have, and they're not being poisoned, and that the planet hasn't gone to runaway global warming. That is what matters. But until people understand that, you can argue with them all you want, and you won't get anywhere. They really have to have to see that and accept that before you can have any sensible conversation about what to do about that. Um, and so long as people remain oblivious to this fact, you can argue about other things all you want. But, uh, until they see that we really are uh, facing a calamity, not for the planet, because life of the planet will go on just fine without us. Uh, but we are in danger of making ourselves extinct. Um, it's very hard to imagine what a long-term future uh, is going to be like for, for architecture, what the, what the long-term plans we can look to 2,000 years ago, but the game is completely different. All the rules have changed. The resources are different. Uh, it's it's impossible to know how we're going to be uh, living on this planet, if at all, uh, in 100 years, 200 years, or 300 years. The industrial experience was a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It was a narrative. It wasn't just something that is established and then goes on forever. That implies that we're going to need to know how to do engineering on a small scale, on a local scale, on a doable scale, on a using materials that are common and still available and, and technologies that are not too high. You know, that's why for me, you know, give me the space that I need. It's not, it's not a lot. Make that space efficient. Make that space healthy. Uh, make it make it in a way that when it's over I feel good about what's gone because of what I did and make it in a way that when I'm gone it itself is just going to melt back into the earth and it's not going to be a big eyesore it's not going to be a gash out of the forest my house is not going to be a gash out of the forest I've been in many cod buildings and they're wonderful. Cobb is, is a real favorite of mine because it's so, you can be so playful with it, you know, you can make these shapes, uh, organic shapes and so on. It's, it's uh, um, you know, it's, you, you can build hobbit houses and you let your imagination run wild. You know, you're not confined to these, you know, flat walls that end in square corners, uh, which is really so boring. 
the square box is in, is in fact one of the worst structures you could ever invent. Um, you notice that nature never has anything square. There's a reason for that. Because probably if there was anything square ever in the five billion years history of nature, it would last maybe a minute. <laughs> because uh, the, the square box is probably, for my research, the most inefficient, ineffective shape in the, in the universe. We need to reinvent these ideas around sheltering ourselves such that it allows us to enhance community because in the energy scarce future, the real social security will be being on good terms with your neighbors. So we need to figure out how, how our living arrangement can support that, can support us being on good terms with our neighbors, being friends, being there, showing up for other people who live near us. Is it possible to offer people a different cultural paradigm that says what's really important to us is our relationships with the people around us, our relationship with the place that we live, our relationship with the stuff in our lives that we eat, that we clothe ourselves with, that we build with. By focusing on those relationships, I think there's a positive ripple effect that will lead out into the rest of the world.